Hello world, Prof Mike Green here with another information literacy video. Today we're going to talk about evaluating sources, whether that's uh, data information, knowledge, or wisdom, wherever we're at on that pyramid. Uh, how do we evaluate that information in order to ensure that it's uh, going to meet our need? I want to start off by kind of figuring out where we're at in the research process. We've already defined our need, which is so crucially important uh, to do right up front. We've already done uh, some primary research finding our, our DIKW. Uh, and as I'm going to jump uh, into later, uh, we want to try to find some stuff, evaluate it, find some stuff, evaluate it. I know in the, you know, in the research process, it's find our stuff, then we evaluate it, and then we organize it. And I recommend we kind of do some cycles of this, but we'll get into that. So let's define evaluation. What does it really mean? If you've watched the uh, critical thinking video, you know that evaluating something means to examine it critically using specific criteria. And uh, as I pointed to a minute ago, it's so crucial and beneficial to do this early on in your research process. If you wait until you you know, think you've found all of your sources, you're done with your research, and then you start evaluating it, what happens if you didn't find good stuff? What happens if you found this one source, you thought it was good, you followed the sources, went deep down the rabbit hole, turns out it was all bogus or it just wasn't to the level of quality that you needed or you kind of changing the direction of your paper or your research a little bit. That's just a horrible place to be. So I recommend find some research, evaluate it, figure out, okay, yeah, I like this. This is the direction I want to go. This looks like it's high quality. And then follow a little more, do some more research, evaluate that, and, and you do this process multiple times. There are several criteria that we're going to talk about when it comes to evaluating uh, sources for academic research. And the first of which uh, I'm titling the type of source. Uh, is it a primary or secondary source? Now, if you don't know what that means, I've got a link below. Check that video out and that should uh, clarify that a little bit. Do you need primary sources for your research? Do you need second? You know, it's all a, goes back to defining your need, which is why I said it was so crucial to know exactly what your need is. Is it a scholarly source? Uh, was it written by someone with a PhD doing, you know, official research meant to go into a peer-reviewed uh, journal? Right, that kind of research uh, is, is high-quality academic research. But do you need that? You know, for instance, in the assignments I require in my class, you do need at least two uh, journal articles of that level. But that's not always the need you're going to have. A lot of times when you're doing industry research, uh, people are, are they're career credential. They're not PhDs. They've got, you know, work experience. That is highly valuable, if not equally valuable, to the PhD research that you might do for our school. So knowing what your need is, is so crucial here when we figure out, well, is this source what I, I want to be looking at? Up next is authority. There's three levels of authority, the author, the publisher, and the owner. Sometimes this is all the same person. If I want to write a blog post on my website, I'm the author, I published it, and I own the site, so I'm all of the above. In this world we live in where self-publishing is so easy, a lot of times one person, one entity, is all three of these. But not always. right? I could write a book that gets published through an official publisher and now all of a sudden those there's two entities so first off the author does the author have the authority to be writing on this material check out the author's web presence go to their website check out their social media feeds Do, does the author appear to have their credentials relevant to this topic again that could be a PhD that could be work experience so it depends on your needs and it depends on the type of research you're doing um, the publisher one of the major benefits of going with an, you know, an official publisher is the credibility that comes along with that name. Sometimes you look at something and it's self-published on the author's website or it's self-published on Amazon and you can think, well, okay, I trust this author, but now I'm also trusting the author as the publisher as well. So the author's credibility is twice as important there. If you're using an official publisher, you gain so much recognition with that name. And then the third one, the owner. Uh, 
a lot of times this is either the author or the publisher who owns the content, right? Uh, but sometimes it, it's another third party. Sometimes there's a parent company involved that, you know, a, a legal terms, copyright terms, owns the content. Do they have an agenda? Are they? A, there's a third party involved that we have to make sure that they are uh, high quality and have the authority to be writing sources on that we're looking for. Up next, currency. And this can vary so wild, wildly depending on the research we're doing. How current is the source? Almost every you know, blog post, web page, journal article, whatever, has some kind of published date on it. Find that date. How current should it be? You know, if you're doing research that is extremely time sensitive, well, is it is it from this year? Is it from this month? Uh, look at the research, the other sources you've found. How does it compare? If you've got a bunch of research that's from the last six months and then this is from four years ago, um, maybe things aren't adding up here. Maybe it's a little behind the times. Uh, and then thirdly, how, how current do you need it? An example I like to think of is what if my research is uh, I'm looking for the best cloud computing provider for my small business. You know, anything that's so focused on technology, technology evolves so rapidly. So I need uh, very current information, very different than if I need to look for um, you know something that's just more more standardized and that I don't have to worry about if it's been written in the last three days. Up next is content. There are five different um, variables that we're going to think about when we examine and evaluate our content of our sources. What is the purpose of the content? Who is the intended audience? And does that audience match my need? If it was written for PhD postdoc scientists, and I'm sitting here doing some undergraduate research, well, it's, it's going to be over my head. A, I'm probably not going to be able to follow it, but it might, uh, it's just not meeting the need uh, of the research that I need to be doing. Is it objective? Is there bias in this source? And this is going to, again, totally depend on what your need is. A lot of people instantly think, All right, if I'm doing academic research, I want completely objective uh, no bias sources and you definitely w always want to include objective no bias sources but what if you're doing an argumentative paper uh, what if you're trying to represent a specific point of view you're gonna need some subjective uh, professional opinion you're gonna need some biased point of views either representing the side that you're trying to argue for or refuting it or both Accuracy and verifiability are really closely linked. Um, if you've watched the research questions video, this goes all the way back to writing our, our research question. Can we verify the answer to my research question? This, this is where we're figuring out if we can do that or not. I like to think, the word that always comes to mind when I think about accuracy and verifiability is to triangulate. Uh, look at the key facts, the key points in the content that you're looking at in this source. And then do some more web searching to triangulate that amongst at least two other points. Uh, if everything looks, uh, you know, if everything lines up, you're seeing the same facts, the same key points, then you're good to go. And then finally, the quality of the source overall, the final product. Does, does it look professional? Does it have a finished look and feel to it? Is the, is the writing well written? Is it presented well? Uh, that's what we're talking about when we say the quality of our content. Now, multimedia has some additional things we need to think about. Functionality. Does it work properly? You know, this can be a simple online video. This could be websites that require a lot of interactivity. Usability. How user-friendly is it? Is it easy to use? Does it make sense? Is it intuitive? And then accessibility. Two answers for accessibility. Uh, does it work for people with disabilities if I'm, you know, visual, audio, motor skills impaired? Does it still work for me? But also in today's worlds of so many devices, so many ways to interact with content, does it work for what I'm on? Uh, you know, if, if it only works on a web browser from 10 years ago and an operating system from 10 years ago, that's not doing me any good. I don't have access to that kind of environment. And so this content is useless for me. So in evaluating DIKW, we want to look at the type of source, 
the authority of those involved, the currency I need. Is it high quality content? Is it functional multimedia? I want to know what evaluation criteria do you think are important for information literate research? Comment uh, below and thanks for watching.